good job with this. So I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Gabriel Boslett. Um, Gabe's an assistant professor of clinical medicine in the Department of Pulmonology, uh, Critical Care Allergy and Sleep Medicine, uh, and has been an affiliate faculty member at our center for the last two years. He's also the associate fellowship director for pulmonary and critical care medicine and the medical director of the MICU at IU Health University Hospital. Um, he has a bachelor's degree from University of Notre Dame and got his MD from the Ohio State University and did his residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the Ohio State University Columbus Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he was on the ethics committee there and won several uh, awards during his tenure, including the Arnold P. Gold Humanism in Medicine Award. He completed his fellowship in pulmonary critical care medicine at IU. Uh, we met him there and he was a chief fellow uh, in his final year of training and then he came uh, to the center to do a, a year-long fellowship uh, at the Charles Warren Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics two years ago. He also happens to have a, a master's degree which he completed at the same time uh, in philosophy and bioethics. And his interests including the effect, include the effects of online social networks in the doctor-patient relationship, post and end-of-life decision-making, and medical futility, and that's what he's going to be talking uh, with us about today. Thanks very much, Gabe. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Is this okay? All right. Um, when, I, when I came here and was trying to decide what to do and what to study um, as a pulmonary critical care fellow, I sat down with Paul actually uh, right when I got here and said, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to do something with ethics. I'd studied as an undergrad a bit. And Paul said, whatever you do, don't do futility. It's, <laughs> it's been done, uh, and, and you'll see why. And, and so uh, it's interesting that I'm giving this talk now. Um, where this came from, uh, we had a case that I'm going to describe in a few minutes um, during my fellowship of a, uh, of a gentleman, and um, I, I was preparing a talk on this case and, and looked back at guidelines on medical futility from all the societies that I belong, including the American Thoracic Society, which is, my, which is really the largest society of pulmonary and critical care physicians, and this was their uh, last statement from 1991 called Withholding and Withdrawing Life Sustaining Therapy, and there were four things in this thing, three of which have become pillars of medical ethics, things like um, surrogate decision making and things like that, um, but section three caught my eye. It said a life-sustaining medical intervention can be limited without the consent of a patient or surrogate when the intervention was judged to be futile, and that sounded pretty reasonable to me. But I read on, and it said it, it's, it, de it defined a life-sustaining intervention as futile if reasoning and experience indicate that the intervention would be highly unlikely to result in meaningful survival for that patient. Here specifically, meaningful survival refers to a quality and duration of survival that would have value, that would have value to that patient as an individual. Survival in a state with permanent loss of consciousness, i.e. completely lacking cognitive and sentient capacity, may be generally regarded as having no value for such a patient. I saw this, and this did not jive at all necessarily with how we um, approached this um, in 2008, I guess this was. So um, I had a couple of Starbucks coffees one morning, and I wrote an email to the um, chair of the uh, Behavioral Science Assembly at the American Thoracic Society and said, hey, you know, this probably needs some work, um, and we could probably do better. It's 20 years later. It was, I think it was coming up on 2011. It's coming up on 20 years. Let's, let's revise this. And I waited a bit, and he emailed me back um, about two weeks later, and I'd kind of forgotten about it. I said, that's a good idea, I, and I've CC'd some people who may be interested in this. And my inbox was lit up for about two weeks with people from all around the country who were like, let's do this. Let, you know. So I wrote um, a project proposal to the American Thoracic Society that's been funded. It's been funded for the last three years. And it's called the Statement on Futility and Goal Conflict in End-of-Life Care and ICUs. Uh, it's been a bit of an albatross, although it's been fun. Um, there, we brought together 20 uh, people from around the country. We've met in person three times. We have uh, uh, conference calls all the time. Um, and have, I've probably revised the manuscript 60 times. It's in what I consider to be hopefully its last revisions. I'm going to share some of what we've come, uh, come, come up with today. This will likely be published in the coming, I don't know, six months to a year as a multi-society statement between the American Thoracic Society, the Society for Critical Care Medicine, the American College of Chess Physicians, um, the American Academy, or the American, or the Association of, uh, the American Association of Critical Care Nursing, and uh, the European Society for Intensive Care Medicine, possibly the last group, but certainly the first floor, four it looks like are going to sign on. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be the arguments we lay out in this paper as to how this should be approached. So here they are, number one. And, and, and I'm going to say right from the outset that many of these are not new arguments. We, are, uh, we have to satisfy a lot of people 
um, in writing a multi-society statement. So it's not like we're completely rewriting things, but we are making some, what I would consider to be some important uh, uh, incremental movements here. Number one, futility should be limited to those interventions that cannot achieve their stated goal. It's a relatively um, conservative view of futility, and it's the one that most people widely agree upon as the one, and I'm going to talk about it in a second. On the other hand, potentially inappropriate interventions are fundamentally different than feudal interventions, and the disputes regarding them should be resolved differently. I'm going to argue that inter interventions within the ICU are fundamentally different than other medical interventions not within the ICU. I'm going to argue that inappropriate treatments, which I'm going to define, which physicians can unilater unilaterally refuse, are extremely limited at this time. So things that are not feudal but, but are inappropriate um, and which, which, which we feel that physicians can unilaterally act on are very limited. And we'll talk specifically about what we mean by that. And physicians should not be the sole deciders in requests for potentially inappropriate treatments. And the potential for judicial intervention, and this may be, this may be controversial, potential for judicial intervention is needed if we're going to move beyond process-based resolution, pro resolution um, processes. Sorry. So a year ago, Paul gave a really good talk on this topic. Um, this is actually one of his slides. And he said that there was a large group of, um, of disputes that are resolved by clinicians at the bedside. That's the gray bar. A small group that are impossible to resolve that are just entrenched value conflicts that will never be resolved regardless uh, of how uh, skilled the clinician. And that's the small yellow bar. And then there was a whole group of these, this sort of pink one with the arrow that were malleable, that seem to be entrenched, but really with good, effective communication could be, could be uh, made to go back to being resolvable. And, and I fully agree with that. And so Paul talked about this, and I'm going to talk about this. Okay, I'm going to talk about, let's say that you have someone who's extremely skilled at communication and just have done a terrific job. There will still be a small number of, of these situations where resolution is not possible, simply because the value uh, Ladenness of these decisions, and there's simply entrenched value conflict. Okay, so th this is what we're going to talk about. Here's the case. So this is the case that uh, that brought this to my attention. 87 year old man with terrible diabetes and had uh, bilateral below the knee amputations was admitted from an outside hospital after being found down by his daughter, who was his caregiver, and she performed successful CPR in the driveway. She got a pulse back after about 20 minutes. He came to us after a few days, and at that time, his exam was consistent with a vegetative state with persistent myoclonus, which was simply jerking from his brain dysfunction. His prognosis was deemed grave by multiple consultants after a, after a very long period of time, weeks, in fact, um, when he didn't wake up. Um, and he had um, progressive renal failure and, and was deemed not a candidate for hemodialysis by the nephrologist. Despite re repeated and prolonged empathic discussions with the daughter, she refused withdrawal of care, and she insisted that he remain a full code. Um, I can tell you that there were multiple very skilled communicators who spoke with this daughter, and she was a vitalist. Her dad was a minister, and she believed that every heartbeat was a gift from God, and she was not willing to give up, um, so much so that she wanted him to endure CPR to get those additional heartbeats. So what we've done in the past, so through the 1990s, and this is kind of rehashing a bit of what Paul wrote, um, we had this whole, this blue circle represents this sort of group of of, of um, treatments that a lot of people thought were futile um, and, uh, or, or thought were at least inappropriate. We shouldn't be providing them. Um, and so what we did was we tried to take this term futility and sort of retrofit it on top of all of these, um, these treatments and procedures and say, look, these are futile and we, can't, we should not be providing them. The problem was is that the de definition was all over the place. Um, and Paul pointed this out in a paper in 1999 published in the New England Journal um, called The Rise and Fall of the Futility Movement. And they, they, they concluded that uh, that, among a couple other things, um, that physicians' lack of consensus regarding a definition was really what did in futility. Um, and, and you can see here that if you look at these, the only one that doesn't entail values uh, in some sort is the one in black, the one at the bottom. Treatments should be defined as futile only when they will not accomplish, accomplish their intended goal. That is an empiric, provable statement, okay? If it, that, that something will not intent, uh, achieve its goal. If it may achieve its goal, if it has a minuscule possibility of achieving its goal, then any decision not to provide it entails values. Values by me that it's not worth it from a cost or time standpoint. Values by me that it's not worth it because of harm to the patient. Even if it's a minuscule possibility, it's, it, it, um, it, it changes it dramatically. Actually, Greg Gramelschbacher, is he here? No. He wrote on this in 1999, so he predated our, our 1989. He predated Paul's paper by 
10 years actually, predated the entire futility uh, debate with what I consider to be one of the best papers on futility and one of the ones that is, is, very, uh, is, is cited not, not, not nearly enough. But they said that the ambiguity, ambiguity of futility determinations frustrates any attempts to establish prospectively that a therapy will have no beneficial effect for a particular patient. This ambiguity will not be overcome by either methodologic, i.e., like the Apache score, or linguistic precision, in other words, by definitions. And this predated, actually, most of the futility debate, and this wound up being true. Wouldn't you agree, Paul? Um, so, so essentially, between this paper, Paul's paper, and a large debate throughout the 1990s, um, sort of the old definition of futility, encompassing anything that entailed any values, for the most people and most, most thoughtful ethicists, sort of went out the window. And that makes sense. It makes sense if you look at the secular definition of futility, right? I mean, why would we use a, a separate definition when we talk about futility in the, in the, outside the hospital and then come into the hospital and use a completely different term? Because futility, uh, the, the Oxford English Dictionary definition says, failing utterly of the desired end through intrinsic defect. In other words, it cannot accomplish what you're asking. So the Society of Critical Care Medicine in 1997 came out and said, look, let's just do away with this whole debate Let's, define, let's call a spade a spade, define futility as simply those things that cannot achieve their stated goal, and move on and deal with these, and, and, and with the acknowledgement that that, that kind of leaves, leaves a lot of things to be desired. And what that essentially does when you define it that way is it shrinks these number of, the, the number of, of, of um, requested treatments that fit this to so small as to really be useless. I mean, if you really look at that definition, me as an intensivist, People don't really request futile things anymore. And when they do, I kind of just say, we're, that's just kind of ridiculous. And when I write about this, and I've, I've, I've been trying to write a considerable amount about this, um, it's hard to come up with definitions of truly futile treatments. We come up with stupid stuff like antifungal therapy for, a non, or for an ST elevation MI, or tube feeds for someone with uh, perforated viscous because the family thinks it's going to heal them. It's things that we wouldn't even really, we wouldn't bat an eye about saying, yeah, we're, we're definitely not going to do that, okay? But, but then we leave this entire bucket, right, the entire blue circle of stuff that we want to be able to say, we, yeah, we don't think we should be doing this. And so what we've done is we've called these potentially inappropriate therapies. This isn't new. Other people have called it this before. Um, but we, we need to acknowledge that this bucket is huge, and the bucket of truly futile things is very small. So how do we deal with these? So the difference between these things, if we call futile uh, tre treatment requests treatments which cannot achieve their goal, uh, we, we're calling potentially inappropriate treatments a treatment which has a chance at achieving the goal, but which clinicians feel should not be provided. It's a very simple definition. The main, dif the main difference is that futile treatments really, I, most everyone, not everyone completely, but most everyone agrees that truly futile treatments are based solely are truly f judgments about true futility are based solely on medical facts and judgments. They're usually empiric things. That absolutely will not work, which means that that is certainly within the purview of clinicians. Potentially in, in, inappropriate, however, includes both medical facts and um, um, values and, and what people see as the good, as, as what they consider to be the good life. And so it becomes much more ethically complex. <clears throat> And in a country like the United States or most Western countries, when you talk about ethically complex things, you, you, it, it becomes um, a quagmire because we live in a liberal political philosophy. And liberal political philosophies are, are based upon liberty um, as their primary value. So the a priori assumption, Locke said, is in favor of freedom, right? Freedom from coercion. So on the left is John Locke, on the right is John Rawls. You, probably most of you don't know them, but the most famous libertarians, honestly, and I use libertarian not in the way that we use it politically now, but in a philosophical sense, are the founding fathers. Um, they founded our country uh, on, on the premise that, we, that every man deserves life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the, the coda of sort of libertarian philosophy. And this philosophy is grounded in the language of rights, right? So there are two features that are, that are absolutely imperative in, in, a, in a liberal society like ours. One is liberty, so freedom from coercion. Um, and one is neutrality, that, that any time that you have laws and policies established by a governing body, that they should not, be, they should not espouse any, basic, any view of the good life, right? I should not uh, tell Dr. Carlos here how he, is to, how he worships or what he pursues, what sort of art he buys, et cetera. 
And most people, this is in a democratic Western liberal society, these are really, in, I mean, we don't even think about these things anymore. They're su such a part of our society. The, and this is um, this idea of non-coercion and of uh, uh, freedom from coercion um, is, is so entrenched in our society. This is the Westboro Baptist Church. And they uh, go to soldiers' funerals and um, yell terrible things about homosexuals and a bunch of other ridiculous stuff that 99.9% .9 of, our, of, our, of the body politic here thinks that this is absolutely ridiculous. But in April of last year, the Supreme Court said that they can do this. They're fully allowed to do this. Because to not allow them to do this is to infringe on their uh, freedom of speech and to, and to unduly coerce them. So obviously, if we're letting these people say this ridiculous stuff at a, the funeral of a fallen soldier, then it's obviously uh, this, this idea of liberty is sacrosanct uh, in our society. So if you look at liberalism and how it's affected medical ethics, prior to sort of um, the, the, the 1900s, most medical ethics codes did not include rights, right? It talked more about the, the, the Hippocratic Oath, talked more about, um, was much more paternalistic, didn't talk about the rights of patients at all until the Nuremberg Code in 1946. And then the AMA principles, which came about in the 1800s, didn't even use language of rights until 1980. So this is relatively new in medical ethics. And then if you look at uh, Quinlan and the Quinlan and Cruzan uh, uh, rulings, which really are two major underpinnings of our how we treat medical ethics in this country today, uh, talking about the removal of a ventilator and removal of a feeding tube. These were both um, decisions based in rights theory. So liberalism and, and the pluralism that it espouses, right, a, a, a pluralistic society, require that decisions that contradict a person's um, um, right to pursue a good life requires public justification with reasons that reasonable citizens would recognize as valid. This is the democratic process. This is why we, in, in November we all go and vote um, and decide who gets to take over the White House and, and uh, seats in the Senate and Congress because this is part of the ju public justification process. When you turn on C-SPAN, that's part of the process that we're going to through as a country to sort of publicly justify how we're going to at least limit people's notions of the good life to, to a small degree. But physicians act unilaterally all the time, all the time. So we can talk about liberal society and pluralism and sort of pat ourselves on the back and say that futility should be limited to those things which cannot choose their stated goal. But we refuse narcotics for headaches all the time. We refuse to provide fourth-line chemotherapy, Palme, uh, to a patient with a poor performance status who we think is going to do very poorly with the chemotherapy. And we refuse to provide antibiotics for upper respiratory infections all the time, even though literally primary care physicians will have patients come in and say, I want an antibiotic. We will say, no, you don't need an antibiotic, or oh, we're supposed to be saying no. You don't need an antibiotic, uh, and I'm not going to give it to you. So we, we unilaterally refuse as an, and as an individual clinician all the time. But why not? We, we don't do it in the ICU. At least intensivists don't do it in the ICU. <clears throat> why not? Well, let's take another case. 56-year-old guy with metastatic colon cancer presents to his oncologist for evaluation after third-line chemotherapy. He lost eight pounds since his last visit and becomes quite winded with trips to the bathroom. He's not been out of the house in the last two weeks. His CAT scan demonstrates widespread advancement of disease, and the oncologist recommends hospice referral, and the patient refuses and demands more chemotherapy. When presented this case, most people, would, most oncologists would say, oh, if, if, they, if they truly believe that this person shouldn't get fourth-line chemotherapy, would say, I'm not going to give him fourth-line chemotherapy. I'm sorry but hospice is your only option. So what's different about that than what we see in the ICU, than the, than the case that I presented before about the 87-year-old man um, who had progressive renal failure and his wife insisted that we do CPR? <clears throat> I think there are three main reasons. Number one, patients lack decisional capacity in the intensive care unit. Almost all the time these things are requested. And throughout most of the rest of, of, uh, of the medical enterprise, specifically research, we protect these pe patients as, vul as vul vulnerable to the nth degree. Anyone who's filled out an IRB on patients in the ICU knows that it can be massively onerous simply to collect someone's uh, uh, basic information. There's significant practice variability, and I'm going to talk about all these at length. And then patients, and I think most importantly, patients are unable to easily seek a second opinion, which means that my decision to not provide something or to withdraw something becomes determinative. I determine, specifically determine the outcome based upon that decision. 
So I see patient's vulnerability. Um, this lack of decision la uh, capacity based on um, the IRB guidebook from uh, Health and Human Services is protected for research. We protect this very much. Um, if you go to Section 4, uh, Chapter 4, Section F, it is specifically on patients who lack decisional capacity and patients who are mentally incapacitated. So if we put in place extra safeguards for research protocols, why wouldn't we for decisions regarding life-sustaining therapies, which really um, will lead to a patient's death? <clears throat> This, I think, is not that strong of an argument, I'll be honest. However, there is a significant amount of variation in ICU practices um, geographically and across the country. This is from the Dartmouth Institute. If you've never seen this, it's very fascinating, actually, to look at. Um, this uh, graphs are, um, shows geographically uh, ICU days in chronically ill patients in the last six months of life. And you can see that they range from 4.6 to 10.7 down to as low as less than 2. Um, in a lot of places in the West. So there's obviously a, a huge variation in uh, geographically in how we use ICU services in general. Although you can make a pretty good argument that, well, look, these, these geographic ch differences are based on sort of local cultural practice, and I will agree. However, if you look at this, this is a fascinating paper from the Journal of Palliative Medicine in 2007, and they followed nine, I think, nine physicians, nine ICU physicians in a closed ICU for three years. And they looked at their, they looked at their likelihood to limit life support it, that was initiating the intensive care unit over all patients. And on the, y, on the x-axis is time after ICU admission. And you can see that the decisions to limit life support initiated in a single ICU in a single hospital ranges from 3% in one physician to almost 50% in another. That is a significant difference. Which means that when you come into the ICU, any ICU, and, and I'll be honest, uh, among my colleagues here at IU, this variation is, is similar. Uh, some people are very quick to limit therapies, and some people will push, 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 and try to, and, you know, with the intent to heal, um, which means that patients who come into the ICU are simply at the mercy of the physician whose name is on the door as to whether or not they're going to get aggressive therapies or palliative care recommended. This undue variation would be fine, except that these patients don't have a choice with who they get. Right? They can't use the medical marketplace like everyone else does. Case number two, the, the, the colon cancer patient with, met, with metastatic disease that had not responded to third-line chemotherapy can simply tell that physician, thank you very much, doc, I'm not interested in hospice, and go down the street and knock on the door of the next oncologist. That's the way the medical marketplace works. If I, if I refuse to prescribe narcotics for headaches, that patient is free to go to another physician and, 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 and request that therapy. And that's, that, that's the check on the system. So because of all these things, care in the ICU is really fundamentally different. So to argue that we do, we do things all the time that are futile um, uh, outside the ICU, it, I, I think that there's, it's a, different in, a difference in kind, not a difference in degree. <clears throat> so thus far, I've at least tried to argue that futility has failed to do the heavy lifting we'd hoped it would in regards to resolving disputes, and that's not a new argument. I've tried to argue that liberalism requires those medical decisions involving values to have an extra level of oversight, specifically public ju justification, and that's not a new argument. If you're interested in that argument, read Ezekiel Emanuel's book called The Ends of Human Life. I think it was published in 1999. It's phenomenal. Um, and I've argued that requests for life-sustaining therapies in the ICU are intrinsically different than other medical decisions. So the argument here then, based on what we've already talked about, is, is that clinicians can refuse unilaterally things that are truly futile, which, I've, again, I've said are really rare. These requests are very rare. And that clinicians should not unilaterally refuse things that are potentially inappropriate. But I don't think this relegates physicians to the role of technicians for disputed non-futile requests, okay? Because we do unilaterally refuse things in the intensive care unit, although they're very limited. <clears throat> People who are brain dead... If the patient, if the family asks us to continue the ventilator, we, we don't. And I, and I don't feel compelled to go to the ethics committee to ask permission to discontinue that ventilator. Patients who ask me to expedite lung transplant, I don't. I will refuse, no problem. Um, and patients who I'm actively doing CPR on and, the, and, the, and we call the code and the family says, please continue, I don't continue. So how, what, are, what are different about these things? I think this is the third category, actually. I think this is what I'm going to call inappropriate, okay? And inappropriate treatments are those which are not futile, but the provision of which is governed either by, and we'll talk about each of these, accepted policies or precedents established by legitimate decisional bodies, or clear and accepted standards of practice. 
and I'm going to qualify both of these, so don't, just everyone relax. <clears throat> so inappropriate treatments governed by accepted policies of precedence established by legitimate decisional bodies are justified by the fact that they're created explicitly, or at least they are said to be. They incorporate diverse input into their creation. They're based on defensible reasons. They're open to appeal, and they're overseen by what are consi widely considered to be, by, to be legitimate decision makers. And, and those decision makers for brain death is the federal government, actually, actually state governments, because the Uniform Determination of Death Act is a state uh, law, but it's been, some version of it has been adopted by all 50 states. And UN UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing, um, governs transplant, transplants. So when a patient has a beef with a transplant issue, they go to UNOS and it's resolved. A patient can go outside of UNOS and sue UNOS. And, but, and that's, another way, uh, that's another oversight mechanism. But it's widely seen that, that, the United, uh, 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 the, that UNOS is a very respected uh, body that, that sort of um, allows us to unilaterally act as clinicians under the auspices of UNOS. So it's sort of not unilateral action when I say I'm not going to expedite your transplant. I'm not acting unilaterally. I'm simply carrying out the dictates of, of UNOS. Clear and accepted standards of practice is probably a bit more sketchy. Um, these are shaped by medical and cultural norms implicitly, not explicitly. There's, you can't go and find them written down anywhere. They're, uh, they probably vary geographically. You could see, see from the Dartmouth uh, Institute's map earlier, they obviously, uh, standards of practice regarding ICU obviously varies dramatically. They probably vary with time. Um, you know, in the early 1960s, almost no one got dialysis and now everyone does. And they entail a large degree of legal uncertainty. Um, if I'm going to act on what I would consider to be a standard of care unilaterally, I don't have, uh, um, um, I don't have the Uniform Determination of Death Act or UNOS you know, behind me to sort of fall back on and say, here's why I did this. <clears throat> but we use these, right? We use it for discontinuation of CPR. We use it to not initiate ECMO for elderly patients with multiple comorbidities, right? So I'm not going to put that person on an ECMO because he's 75 and he has... Uh, metastatic cancer. We, we make those intrinsic decisions all the time in the ICU. Um, and some places have said that uh, pe patients with hepatorenal syndrome, so kidney failure because their liver has failed, um, and patients who are not transplant candidates, they will not initiate hemodialysis for these patients, simply because they don't do it there and they consider it their standard of practice. <clears throat> there are caveats with both of these. First of all, um, except there are very few accepted policies and precedents established by legitimate decisional bodies. I think I probably reviewed all of them on my slide. Um, Great Britain's NHS does this well. Um, the Oregon Health Plan, interestingly, uh, has tried to do this with Medicaid and, and, and has had some success, although, boy, it was controversial in the mid-'90s. But I think that these will increase as financial pressures in increase. So... To, get, to give a couple examples of Oregon Health Plan, uh, this I took directly from their prior, they have a prioritization list in Oregon. If you're on Medicaid, um, there's a group that sits down and, and prioritizes. I think there's 570 lines of therapies. And as of right now, they have approved the, the top 498. If, if you have a, 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 a problem that falls within the top 498, they'll cover it. If it, does, if it falls in the last uh, 72, it's not covered. Um, it includes this treatment with intent to pro treatment for advanced cancer. Sorry, with intent to prolong survival is not covered for service. Is not a covered service for patients with any of the following. This is in there. I don't know how much they use this because it's not very controversial anymore, and I don't think they use this that much. But this is on the books. I, I you can go to this website and see it. I accessed it just a few days ago. Um, if you have a median survival of less than six months with or without treatment, you should not get chemotherapy. We will not play for chemotherapy. If the tr expe expected uh, treatment has less than 50% chance of, uh, of working in the median survival with that treatment in 6 to 12 months, you won't get it. Um, if it's more than 12 months, but the, uh, you're expected to improve median survival less than 30%, you won't get it, et cetera, et cetera. So things like Tarceva for lung cancer is not covered by Medicaid in, in Oregon. And actually, that's, um, there have been lawsuits about this. So it is controversial, but Oregon has tried sort of and failed miserably. There's great papers on the Oregon Health Plan experiment from 1994. Uh, 
as far as clear and accepted standards of practice, the, the main problem with this is that there is no legal safe harbor. Okay, if you are going to go out on a limb and say that it is a standard of practice to not provide hemodialysis for a patient with hepatorenal syndrome, you better be darn clear that in your area that is firmly entrenched. And the problem is, is that if you get sued, that there's always a, a nephrologist from somewhere else that say that we do this all the time. Um, and that's because standards of care are very based on local medical norms, cultural priorities, geographically with time, et cetera. And they're dynamic, right? So dialysis, uh, dialysis is widespread now because CMS decided to make everyone who, was, who had end-stage renal disease um, a Medicaid recipient in the 1960s, right? Prior to that, actually, in, in the state of Washington, there was a panel of people who decided whether or not you got dialysis. And most, feel, most people, most ethicists, and most clinicians feel that um, there are very few clear and accepted standards of practice that allow for unilateral decision-making. So this is really where we're at, right? So we have this tiny box that's futile, this other tiny box that's inappropriate, and we still have this gigantic bucket of, what, of, of continued potentially inappropriate therapies. And what are some of those? <clears throat> So should we be providing dialysis for patients with hepatocene and renal syndrome? I would argue here is potentially inappropriate, not inappropriate, just based on the way that we practice um, in Indianapolis. Should we be providing critical care for patients in a per persistent vegetative state? Should we admit patients to the ICU uh, with advanced dementia and in declining health who are a failure to thrive? And should we provide CPR for a patient with advanced metastatic cancer? I think these are all reasonable. I think there are a whole myriad more. So the question then is how and who decides? So there's options. Do the physicians decide? Do the patients get to decide? Do they just get to sort of um, reduce us to the role of technicians in these, in these issues? Does a third party decide? Or do we let society decide? I think these are all on the table. <clears throat> I'm going to argue that physicians should not automatically, automatically have unilateral decisional capacity in these. For the three reasons that I talked about earlier that separated ICU decisions from other medical decisions, which are the first three, and then the fourth one that I'm going to talk about now called the Generalization of Expertise, which was um, a paper published by Robert Feach in 1973. And the argument for the Generalization of Expertise says this. Scientific expertise in an area does not entail that the person who has that expertise um, has the knowledge of how to carry out, or how or whether or not to carry out that um, piece of technology. Okay, let me give you an analogy because that's confusing. So this guy came up with this, which created this, right? But Einstein's knowledge of E equals MC squared did not make us automatically turn to Einstein and say, okay, who do we drop this bomb on? In fact, people would have thought that's ridiculous, right? So just because Einstein had the technical knowledge to come up with E equals MC squared, which directly led to the atomic bomb, did not mean that we automatically thought he had the normative knowledge of how that should be utilized. I think the same thing works in the intensive care unit. Just because this guy knows about ventilator waveforms doesn't mean I should automatically be the person that does this. Okay? I actually think the analogy works really well. I'd like to hear if anyone doesn't. <laughs> and that really is the crux of Veach's argument, and it's a very compelling argument. So the way that we've gotten through this uh, sort of since the late 1990s was to go to process-based dispute resolution. First published by the Society of Critical Care Medicine in 1997 by Bob Trug, who's actually working, um, uh, is on the writing committee for the current paper that I'm writing. Um, and then uh, the American Medical Association came out with a very similar statement in 1999 saying we should go to process-based resolution. Um, and then the bottom is actually the, the, the statute of the Texas Advanced Directives Act, which sort of codified it in law and gave uh, legal safe harbor to physicians who carried that out. So these are the five things that we have said are ethically needed in order to justify uh, 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 an, uh, sorry, in order to have an ethically defensible process resolution uh, procedure. Most of these are included in what was previously written. Some of them weren't, and we're going to talk about those probably more than anything else. The first, and we emphasize this, which was the subject of Paul's talk a year ago, is continued engagement, communication, and emotional support for the surrogates. This is, we have, in our paper, we, in our manuscript, we have four recommendations. The first one is that uh, institutions and physicians gain knowledge and in, in effective communication skills. The second um, um, element is review by interprofessional hospital review committees. This isn't new. The third is opportunity for transfer to a willing provider. This isn't new. The fourth is availability of an independent appeals mechanism. This is new. And the fifth is, is having institutional support of the process. This isn't new. 
So four of the five, we simply come together and say, look, these five societies all think that these are worthy, but we think that this should go in there too, and we'll talk about all of them. So continued engagement is very important. This process and the fact that you think that something is inappropriate should not be viewed as a trump card to stop discussing things with the family. Okay, I think that's what a lot of clinicians do. We're not providing this, I'm done talking about it, let's go get the ethics committee involved. But it should be seen as the beginning of a difficult and lengthy process of amplified communication and emotional support for that family. Okay, so it's extremely important that communication by the primary clinician continue, and Paul talked about this extensively a year ago, I'm not gonna belabor this point. Review by an interprofessional intramural committee I think is extremely important. I think that there are specific um, aspects of this that have to be emphasized. First, I think that the family should get written notice regarding the fact that this process has initiated so that they know exactly what's about to happen. These, uh, this committee should strive for community member input. I don't think it's imperative, but I think it's um, important at least to try. It's, this has been tried places. It's very difficult to get community members engaged, um, but I think it's important. It should obviously actively engage surrogates input into the process. The task of this committee should be to evaluate clinicians' judgments regarding appropriatenesses of, of the requested therapies, not as a medical second opinion, but the ethical appropriateness. And lastly, the decision should include reason getting, giving and should be provided in writing. This is part of the Texas Advanced Directives Act, so this isn't necessarily new, but I do want to emphasize one thing. Reason giving and written reason giving, and this comes from a Norm, Norm Daniels paper from 1997, which I think really is good, leads to fairer decisions over time for two reasons. First, formal requirements of fairness are better met since there's consistent treatment of similar cases. Second, the discipline involved in specifying the appropriate reasons and making sure they really bear on the case promotes thoughtful evaluation of these reasons and their foundations within our thinking. To the extent that we are then better able to discover flaws in our moral reasoning, we are more likely to reach fair decisions. There's something about putting things in writing that makes you be very precise about your language and your thoughts, and I think this is extremely important. I think there's another, I think there's a third actually important reason for, important uh, <clears throat> function of reason giving, and that's because it sets local precedent, right? So let's say we got this committee going and we kept a book of these decisions that we've had. When similar cases come up, much like case law, we can at least re go back to those and say, okay, here was our decision in a very similar case, why we came to it, is this fundamentally different or not? The next element is opportunity for transfer to a willing provider. This helps clarify standards of care, right? So if your hospital is trying to seek willing providers for 20 cases in a row and they find someone 20 times in a row, you guys may want to, we may want to reevaluate whether or not we're really sort of picking the right cases um, to refuse care. And the clinicians in the institution should share responsibility with the family in seeking this out. This is very overwhelming for a family. They don't know how to call St. Vincent and get a physician on the line and sort of give them the, the idea. So rather than throwing it into the family's lap, we should be facilitating this process, and I think most of us do when it really comes down to it. This is the one I think that is uh, controversial, and, I, and I'm happy to hear people's thoughts about this. The fourth is availability, availability of an independent appeals mechanism um, for those cases that people want to appeal. And several of the reasons uh, Bob Trug and, and J.P. Burns, uh, who are both participating uh, in the writing of this manuscript, have written that these ethics committees look exactly like the physicians who are making the claims that this is inappropriate, right? I, in fact, I'm on the ethics committee here. So I frequently participate in these. I don't participate when I'm the attending physician, but I do when it's my colleagues. So there seems to be a bit of a conflict of interest and really to, to imply that I am fully impartial, I'm not sure is being completely um, forthright. And the availability of an independent appeals mechanism, at least the potential, ensures that public justification is available for hard cases. Doug Wyden and, and Thad Pope, Thad Pope's a lawyer from, he's now at Widener University, he's actually participating with us in this manuscript, um, wrote a paper in uh, JAMA uh, that came out a few months ago and talked about this. I actually helped them write it, but they could only have two uh, authors. I was really pissed, actually. Um, and they said that, that allowing for judicial intervention, they say specifically judicial intervention. We don't say that in the paper. We say third-party appeal. But really what we're talking about in the United States is judicial, is, is appeal to a court. Um, there are three uh, reasons why this may have benefit. First, it encourages intensive communication. If I know that in the course of this process that you can go to the court 
and tell the court, you know, tell on me and ask them to sort of make me do this, I'm going to be a lot nicer. And I'm going to continue the communication process. More importantly, I think that uh, a couple of these cases, getting to a court would really cast a long judicial shadow for, uh, for extra, extra judicial solutions. One of the problems with futility is there are no judgments. There are no legal, there's no, we have no legal guidance on whether or not the courts think that it's okay that we unilaterally do or don't do things. So look back to Cruzan and Quinlan, right? So Quinlan said that uh, you could withdraw a ventilator on a patient um, with a, you know, uh, period. I'm, I'm going to simplify it that way. We don't have cases going to court now about whether or not we can withdraw a ventilator. If we did, I would never be out of the courtroom. I'm doing it three times today, actually, over at, at university. So, uh, you know, people have argued for a long time to keep these things out of the courts. And, and what we argue is that one of the problems is that we fought so hard to keep these out of the courts that we have no guidance. A couple of these, these sort of um, paradigmatic cases going through the courts would at the very least provide us with some guidance on how the courts think we should be doing this. And how, and, and how the courts think we should be doing this, at least theoretically, is a surrogate for how society thinks we should be doing this. And lastly, it would shine a spotlight on unresolved and undiscussed social issues, right? We don't talk about this. We don't talk about these issues. Uh, you don't hear about it on Dr. Oz or anywhere else. Um, and it, at the very least, these cases coming up, they do it in Canada. They've done it a good job in Canada. They had the Marachli case. They have another case right now, um, the um, Rasuli case, that's still going through. It's in front of the Canadian Supreme Court. They do a good job of talking about it, partly because they, have, they, they work on a health care budget. But these are the three reasons why. Uh, White and Pope argued for this, and these are one of the reasons why we're saying that this should be part of this process, is at least allowing the, the, the family to know that if you want us to, if, if you disagree with this um, in a timely fashion, you can go to court and, comp and ask the court to, to, to um, compel us to provide this therapy. There are other potential third-party mechanisms. The Ontario Consent and Capacity Board is a lawyer, a physician, and a layperson in the state of Ontario, and it determines things like this. When there's disagreements between physicians and um, patients regarding uh, these decisions, it goes before this board. And often they decide that it's not appropriate to provide some of these therapies. The Joseph Marashley case was a young kid with neurologic, uh, with a severe uh, progressive neurologic uh, problem, was on a ventilator, and, or, or, or was not on a ventilator, but the family requested tracheotomy, and the hospital said no way. And it went before the uh, Ontario Consent and Capacity Board, and the Consent and Capacity Board said no way. And so they moved him down to... Um, St. Louis and got it anyways. Um, so, uh, but it's a very effective way that they go about keeping it out of the courts, but keeping it with a sort of a public that you can go on and look at and read the decisions of the Ontario Co Consent and Capacity Board for any of the decisions that they made. You can read them, uh, the Marachli decision. It's really fascinating. And then prospective collective decision-making bodies. And actually, uh, the National Health Service in Great Britain has done this actually pretty well. They don't do it anymore, but they did. So they, had, uh, they have something called the Nice Citizens Council, right? And that's 30 people that they randomly draw out and say, we want you to come together and discuss and write up a paper on a question that we're going to put in front of you. And one of the questions that they put in front of them was, is there a prefer preference to save the life of people in imminent danger of dying instead of improving the life of people whose lives are not in immediate danger or saving the lives of many people in future through disease pre prevention programs. This was their Citizens Council report on the rule of rescue. And NICE, which determines how they utilize their fixed health care budget, uses this input to determine, uh, to determine how they prioritize uh, things. It's, I'm not going to tell you what they said. You can go online and read it. It's available online. It's fascinating. They hedged, uh, like everyone assumed that they would. Um, but this is something that they do very well prospectively in Great Britain. Lastly, we'll talk about institutional support for the process. Um, uh, and this is present um, both in, um, in, in the Texas Advanced Directives Act obviously has, has the um, supreme institutional support of the state. Um, but obviously, this provides credibility to controversial decisions and also supports clinicians to help both diffuse moral distress, right? Not only physicians, but nurses at the bedside, but also to help physicians through this process. If they're going to have to go to court, to defend this, we're gonna, we're gonna need help from the institution to say that yes, we do back this up. Let's talk about some caveats regarding this, what we've laid out as what we think to be the most ethically defensible process-based resolution. Um, the hope is that it will bring about a sort of local process of precedent type decisions with potential for third party appeal. So that these precedents can provide guidance to the, to the local clinicians on how we do things around here. Okay, 
and that over time, the whole of these decisions will help provide firmer guidance rega regarding what local standards of care are. We don't have anything like this right now. <clears throat> so if you look at it this way, so if we think something's potentially inappropriate to go through the procedural resolution process, the thought was that the, the number of, of uh, treatments that are considered inappropriate over time slowly will grow without having to go to court, without having a judge to get involved, will slowly grow because we determine what we think is ethically defensible and, and is appropriate. So there isn't a lot of that's unique in what we're putting together in our statement, but here are the things that are. The creation of a third category of inappropriate treatments, things that are, don't meet fu um, the criteria of futility, but that nonetheless physicians can unilaterally um, not provide. It's a very small list now, but again, like I said before, it's a dynamic list that, that can grow if we do sort of the hard work of getting through some of these cases. And acknowledgement that the potential for extramural intervention is needed for movement on this issue. The Texas Advanced Directives Act specifically denies families the ability to go to court to request that the, that the um, treatment be compelled. They can go to court and get an extension on the 10-day window, but they cannot ask the judge to decide on the merits of the case, whether or not the, whether or not the judge thinks that the, that the um, requested treatment is appropriate or inappropriate. So I, I, I provided a lot of arguments, and we've been through a lot right now, and it's perfect timing. We have 10 minutes. But bedside clinicians should not be looked to as the ultimate arbiters in disputes regarding potentially inappropriate treatments. We are certainly have a major, uh, a major role in the process and drive it more than anyone else. Um, but I, don't th I think that to say that we can simply decide what's appropriate and inappropriate, it just it hasn't worked thus far. There's no reason to think it's going to work going forward, and I don't think it's even ethic ethically justifiable. And procedural resolution processes must engage, must engage socially legitimate arbiters in order to move the debate toward establishing usable appropriateness signposts. If we're going to know better in the future what's appropriate and inappropriate, we're going to need some societal input. And the most efficient way to do that in the United States is through the court system. I want to thank Doug White, who's my co-chair on this project with the American Thoracic Society, Charles Warren Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics, who if I hadn't done the fellowship uh, for all of you new fellows, uh, this, I, this would never have happened. Um, I want to thank Paul for his uh, urging me not to do anything with futility, um, and also for your uh, talk uh, a year ago, which really kind of set up uh, perfectly a lot of what I talked about in the American Thrust Society for funding the project. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Go ahead. Yeah. So the yeah the question the question is how involved should how involved do I think the court should be and how involved do I think they anticipate that they will be. Given that a lot of these are time sensitive, right? Well, the court's, the court's there to defend the autonomy of the patient, first of all. Um, and let me say this, that obviously going to court to compel me to continue CPR is a ridiculous thing. That will never happen. There, some of these things require that a physician have some discretion simply because they're time sensitivity. How involved do I think the courts will be in these? I honestly. Um, I don't think that they want, the courts have proven that they do not want to get that involved in this stuff, right? Anytime that physicians have gone to a court to say, hey, this person's asking us to do this and we don't want to do this, the court says, what are you doing here? I don't, I'm not a physician. I'm not going to answer this question. So I think that, that if, we have put to, if we have put together an intramural due process that is explicit and uh, somewhat legitimate and very well set out, in, in a policy that anyone who goes to the court and say, hey, we want them to provide this, and the court to look through this process that they've, they've gone through, that we've gone through, I think any court would say, we, there's, no, there's nothing to do here. The, the, you, they've done, you've done their due process, they've done their due process, and, and this, is a, this is a reasonable process to resolve this. Now, we could be extremely wrong, and this could backfire horrendously, right? If there's courts that want to get involved and want to... Um, promote a vitalist sort of view that every heartbeat is worth it, then we're kind of 
really <laughs> screwing things up. But we won't know until we go. And we're stuck in a quagmire right now of, of not knowing. So I, I, I don't think personally that they're going to want to get that involved in the sort of granularity that you're talking about at all. I don't think they're going to even want to get involved from a 30,000 foot view. I think that what they're going to want to do is look and say that, see that we have a reasonable process in place that we follow and that we follow that process. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is whether or not we're proposing this to protect ourselves from lawsuit or to determine what is really appropriate and inappropriate. That's a really, that, who are you? That's a really, <laughs> really good question. Okay. <laughs> oh. um, that's a great question. Um, no, I don't think that we're doing this to protect ourselves from lawsuits. I, I think this seems like a completely, and in fact, I think in the short term, we're, we're putting ourselves out there even more, and I think most physicians feel that way. I, I think that when this, if, if this is the final version of this statement that gets published, I think there will be a lot of people really upset that this is what we've said because we are saying we are inviting the courts to become involved. And look, we want, all we want is some guidance. Uh, there was a case, the Betancourt case. You know the Betancourt case? The Betancourt case was in the state of New Jersey and was going to be the futility case. It was being argued on the merits of futility. And the problem, as with most futility cases, is Reuben Betancourt died before they, could, before they could rule. Now, the court had a chance to rule anyways and to say that this had such bearing, wide bearing on society in general that we're going to go ahead and rule even though it's moot, and they didn't. They ruled it moot. So we desperately simply want some guidance from the courts as what I would consider to be the, the societal barometer as to how they want us to handle these cases. So I don't consider this to be a way for us to avoid lawsuits. I actually think this is a way we may get into more trouble in the short term than, than, than need be, but we need, some, we need some of us to do this. Okay? Ruben Betten, or, uh, Gordon Rubenfeld in Canada is doing this right now, uh, and they have the, the Rasuli case. Uh, that they've decided to circumvent the Canadian Capacity and Consent Board, and that's, I mean, he's really hanging his neck out there. But, but we need to know, so it's a great question. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I think for those few patients that go through the process, the judicial process, I think you're right. But I think again that 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 judicial process will catch such a shadow that it will it will at least start to put these things to rest as to how, how society feel, what society feels is appropriate and inappropriate. You may be right. This, may, and this, this would be a social experiment that may, that may completely backfire. But I think in the long term, it would actually shorten them. I think, it would, I think it would make things more explicit, not only for physicians, and I think this is an important point, but for, but for lay people as well. That we don't, we don't, you know, here are the things that we think are appropriate as a society, and here's the things that we don't. So if you go into, into an ICU with them, you should not expect to get them. Steve. Mm -hmm. So the question is why I don't address legislative interventions. And I, I think there's actually two separate questions there, if I can't, can't see even correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one is you're talking about funding mechanisms. And, and I'll be honest, it, the, the hand will be forced when we work under a federal health, or not a federal, but a national health budget. Right? Once we realize that we, we, we have, have only X number of dollars to spend on health care, a lot of these will become, will, will go through legislative processes. And I think that that's a, that's a mode of public justification which is reasonable. Um, the other argument that, that you know, because part of what I'm arguing here is that the Texas Advanced Directives Act has, has an intrinsic flaw in that these individual cases can't go before the courts. And I think a very reasonable rebuttal to that is to say, look, 
the Texas Vacancy Directive Act went through a public justification process, right? It went through the legislature. It was signed by Governor George W. Bush. Um, and I think that is a um, reasonable argument. Uh, my counter argument to that would be to say the problem with the Texas Advanced Directives Act is you keep everything behind a veil, of, a veil of secrecy in the hospital, and so it's not discussed as a societal level at all. It's discussed by an ethics committee in a boardroom and never, and never made explicit at all. So it, while it's great for Texas, um, although a, a lot of people argue that it's not great for Texas, it doesn't do anything for the rest of us who don't have legislatures who, who, who want to move this forward at all. It's, a, it's not a great argument, but it is one. It's a good question. Make it easy, Robin. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that we are getting all of these groups together to write this is to sort of compel hospitals to sort of take a, put a foot forward in this process. I'll be honest, I, I've been surprised by the amount of institutional support when we've had these issues come up at the Ethics Committee here. Um, for the most part, um, the administrative, administration, we always thought it would diet legal, right? I mean, that's what we always said um, a few years ago before we even tried this, but it, it hasn't. Um, legal is usually very supportive and saying this seems totally reasonable and let's go ahead. And they're sticking their heads out there big time. So um, you know, the, the statement that we're writing is simply from the you know, asking help from the institutions, the society, to give us guidance because we struggle with this every day in the intensive care unit of whether or not what we're doing is, is right when a lot of us don't feel that it is, physicians, nurses, um, and, and respiratory therapists, et cetera. So, the institutions have a huge role, and, and one of the reasons that we've written this is to sort of compel them to, to help us. Okay, I'd like to thank Gabe. His fans can line up for admiration <laughs> down here, and we'll, we'll see you next month. <laughs>